The month of Ramadan is upon us, the month in which the gates of paradise are open, the gates of hell are closed, the month in which the Qur'an was revealed, and the month where miraculously two billion Muslims are able to fast from dawn to sunset with no complaints, insha'Allah. Today we are joined with a very special guest, Sydney's own, if I can still call him that, Sheikh Abu Bakr Zaud, someone who has spent years dedicating to the community in Sydney, along with his family, along with his father, someone who spent years studying the Quran and diving deep into its understanding. Sheikh Abu Bakr Zaud, it's an honor to have you here. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you for the work you've done in the community and to make you from Ahlul Quran. Jazakallah khair. It is an honor, it's a privilege for me to be here with you. Inshallah, looking forward to our interview with Allah Ta'ala. Inshallah. Thank you for coming. This is the first time we have you on the podcast. Long overdue, but Mashallah. alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Oh, may Allah accept. Sheikh, since it is your first time on the podcast, I have to do a rapid fire just to break some Mashallah. ice, make it a bit Mashallah. easy, inshallah. So it may be a bit non-conventional, but inshallah, mm. forgive us. Bismillah. The first question I would ask you is, what is the one aspect of Ramadan you are most looking forward to? The fasting. The fasting. No. Out of all things, that's like the hardest part of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. Especially in Sydney, by the way, which is going to be very hot this Ramadan. Allah. No. Fasting is the, that's the pillar of Ramadan. Fasting, that's the obligation. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that if you master, you earn that taqwa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised. And since this is the obligation, every bit of attention and focus needs to be uh, put into the fasting. Allah. Everything else comes as uh, a voluntary deed, mm-hmm. like the charities mm-hmm. or the Quran reading or Salat al Layl, uh, at Taraweeh, and so on. These are not obligatory. Mm-hmm. The obligatory deed that is in Ramadan is the fasting itself. Sure. So, this has to be on top of the list for everyone. Okay. So, abstaining from food and drink is the one thing you're most looking forward to. MashaAllah. So, on that point, then I would ask you. What is your perfect iftar? You know, the meal that would just bring a smile to your face. You come home, you know, that joy that the Prophet Sallallahu no. Alaihi Wasallam speaks about. No. What is that one meal that would bring the most like, happiness to your face? Wallahi, Akhi Kamal, yani, subhanallah, I speak from experience. Mm-hmm. Over the years, there's nothing that I looked forward to on a table, really, that I had actual passion for. Whatever was on the table, MashaAllah, it is always nice. It's always a ni'mah. You eat it, you don't take it for granted. We say Alhamdulillah, and life moves on. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, pardon me, doesn't, I, I can't, I can't. Sheikh, you're Lebanese, come on, there, there has to be some Lebanese dish, Lebanese cuisine. And, and this is this is actually myself. Allah. Wallahi, and I don't have anything of a meal that I actually look forward to. All of it is beautiful, and I love it all. Whatever is there, we eat, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Especially if it's cooked by the mother, by the wife, by a family member, it tastes even better, mashallah. Mashallah. So it's okay. the person who made it. Mashallah. I guess that's, that's, the that's love. I think the love on the table. Subhanallah. Allah. Allah. Perhaps Allah. what it is. That's the secret, maybe. Mashallah. That's beautiful. Okay, um, Sheikh. We know that the Quran has many names. If you could pick one name of the Quran that speaks volumes to you, that you could choose, and why? Al Furqan. Allah. Yeah. Al Furqan. Al Furqan. It comes from the word Farq. Wafarq means to differentiate mm-hmm. because that's the Quran and that's what it does. It allows you to differentiate between matters of disbelief and matters of belief. It allows you to differentiate between what is misguidance and what is guidance. What is loved by Allah, what is hated by Allah. You know, the difference between sadness and a depressed, miserable life and a happy life and a life of pleasure and success. Al Quran gives you that difference in your life it differentiates between what is miserable for a person and what is beneficial and good for a person it is a name of the quran that actually stands out tabarak alladhi nazzala al-furqana ala abdihi liyakuna lil'alamina nadhira 
And Allah Azza wa praises himself that he revealed Al-Furqan. And there's an entire surah in the Quran called Surah Al-Furqan. Mm-hmm. Beautiful surah that explains to you the power of the Quran and how it transforms people's lives to see the path of guidance, the path of light, and to also know the path of guide, misguidance and darkness and to keep away from it. That's the purpose of life. Al-Furqan. Al-Furqan. No. A beautiful name. Allah Akbar. Sheikh. The Quran has, I guess, multiple descriptions, illustrations of Jannah. What is your favorite description of Jannah in the Quran? Allahi, yani if it came to the to the description of the paradise, mungkin when Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, when he described the state of the abrar, and he said about them at the beginning, in al-abrar yashrabun, yashrabun min ka'sin kana mizajuha kafura. Allah Azza wa Jal, when he spoke about the abrar, the abrar are people that rush to the obedience of Allah, to righteous deeds. The first thing that they will enjoy in the paradise, he mentioned, يَشْرَبُونَ مِنْ كَأْسِ They drink from a glass of wine. كَانَ مِزَاجُهَا كَافُورًا It is mixed with kafur. Well, kafur is the name of a sweet-tasting river that is flowing in the paradise. The idea of just Allah Azza wa Jal enticing us with a drink at the doors of the paradise. Yani if, if that's the drink, what's, what else is going to be inside of this paradise that Allah Azza wa Jal is going to give? It's always the drinks in the paradise mm-hmm. that captures my attention in a unique way. Then the drink, yani, and to imagine a day goes by, you weren't able to drink. How thirsty does a person become? How worried do you become? You dehydrate, people die from dehydration. But then to think in Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy upon the believers and one of his gifts is that he gives them to drink يشربون, يشربون. They are given to drink and then also um, within the same surah at the end Allah Azza wa Jal he says وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ wow. Their Lord gives them to drink. There's something unique about drinks in the paradise mm. that it reaches the point where Allah himself is giving you you know, sometimes you're invited to, to a gathering and then the host, the owner of the house may give you some drinks to drink. You feel a little bit special if the host comes. Sometimes he sends his children. They go around with the tray and they give you a drink and you drink. Imagine here Allah Azza wa Jal himself. He's the one that is offering this drink. How does it look like? I don't know. But it's something that... Uh, the mind can't imagine, but it's desperately looking forward to to see how Allah Azza wa Jal is giving His servants to drink. Subhan. Something unique about this, subhanAllah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us worthy Amen. of it. Amen. I've heard that verse so many times, but just it just literally resonated with me right now. The Bamir is Allah, subhanAllah. That's Allah that's hey, giving you the no, drink. No. And then when you look at the amount of marketing that's spent on you know alcoholic drinks today, literally I was, I was driving through the city one day and I saw this massive billboard says how does this make you feel and they had pictures of alcohol bottles and i'm sure it would have you know made people feel amazing incredible those that would like to indulge in those drinks but then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he markets the drinks of the quran the drinks of jannah allah, 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 in, in the most allah. beautiful yeah. way to entice us to work towards his jannah may allah make us of the people Ameen. of jannah Ameen. Ameen. Sheikh, you've spent obviously many years abroad studying you've actually left sydney you went overseas to study if you can relate to us one of your most memorable moments while studying abroad, think about it. In terms of what I learned? In terms oh. of what you learned, an experience you had, okay. just something which was so memorable that you could share with our audience today. One thing that, yeah, and it, it still lives with me until this very day. And it's got to do with the Quran. Um, it's a piece of knowledge that I learned that was so simple and I had never understood it before no matter how much I read about it that's the moment that I can remember it was when the Sheikh described and explained what does it mean to do the Dabbur al-Quran how to ponder over mm-hmm. the Quran I can pretty much repeat it word for word due to its simplicity I think and I reckon I had read so many books before that and watch so many lectures just to understand what does it mean to ponder over the Quran and I never ever ever got to the bottom of it I'd always think ponder reflect understand yeah I need I don't know what does that mean yeah just but what does it mean I had no clue 
How, how, what's he going to do with me? How does it change mm. me? But this Shaykh, Allah, he fi, he explained that, Allah, in less than five minutes. And it's always in my mind. And I have this passion to always deliver this message because it'll actually teach you what Tadabbur al-Quran is. Mm. You know, Akhi, uh, Kamal, of course, the purpose of the Quran is to ponder over it. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ how, does, how is that achieved practically? Shuf, he shared with us an opinion, a statement of Al-Hasan al-Basri, in where he said, وَمَا تَدَبُّرُ آيَاتِهِ إِلَّا بِالتِّبَاعِهِ That pondering the Qur'an is to follow the Qur'an, to follow its instructions. So, when I read, when I read, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish الصَّلَاةِ Then I get up and I pray the next prayer, Al-Dhuhr, Al-Asr, Al-Maghrib. I am actually doing tadabbur al-Qur'an in its highest form because I'm implementing what Allah told us. Mm. If I read an ayah about the greatness of Allah and the greatness of Allah Azzawajal increases in my heart, that's tadabbur al-Qur'an. If I read an ayah of the paradise and I am encouraged to do a deed that brings me a step closer to the paradise, that's tadabbur al-Qur'an. Mm. If I read an ayah about the hellfire and the fear of Allah Azzawajal increased something in my heart, that is tadabbur al-Qur'an. If I read an ayah about the virtue of sadaqat and donation, and I put my hand in my pocket, or, you know, today it's on digital, I wanted to send a sadaqah to a charity organization. Because I read that ayah, that's tadabbur al-Qur'an. Yani tadabbur al-Qur'an now isn't something abstract and far away from our lives. Here, this is how it is mm-hmm. achieved. Read something. If it moves you in terms of your heart, you increased love for Allah. You increased in, um, uh, in in glorifying Allah. You increased in the fear of Allah Azza You move towards action. This is it. This is why the Quran was revealed. That's why it's a transformative book. Nothing on earth could do this other than the word of Allah Azza wa That's something that stands out in my life, and I know exactly where I learned it and where I took it from. Allah. What, a, what a beautiful explanation that you know to dabbur. Reflecting on the Quran Allah isn't Akbar. just some mental exercise, Allah Akbar. but rather something that we do on, on a daily basis. And Subhanallah. That's what stands out. You know, like if if all my years of traveling was for that, that would be worth it. It would be worth it. To, to get to that point, to learn that, it would be worth it. Allah. Alhamdulillah. Allah. Sheikh, thank you for that. It's absolutely Allah you know benefit. beautiful the way you've, absol- you, you've, you've answered all those questions. We'll move on to the first question I wanted to ask you. Sheikh, you recently delivered a lecture titled Ruh al Ruh for khutbah, for, for the Friday sermon, whereby you reflected upon the words of uh, Khalid Nabhan from that viral video of him farewelling his granddaughter, saying, uh, Ruh al Ruh, you know, the, the soul of my soul. Two words that, you know, went across the world and went viral, and they had such a profound impact on everyone that watched that video. Yet you were able to say Ruh al-Ruh, the soul of the soul, was also the Qur'an. Walk us through this idea and the inspiration behind it. SubhanAllah, yeah. So as you said, you know, it was a, a phrase and an expression that is still trending mm-hmm. until today. Non-Muslims, non-Arabs, they all memorized and learned a bit of Arabic so yeah. that they can reflect over these words. The idea is um, Allah Azza wa Jal created us two parts, mm-hmm. a body and a soul. This body was created from the earth, so all its needs come from the earth. We eat from the earth, we drink from the earth, and so on. If we deprive our body from what comes from the earth, we're going to damage the body, it'll die, and it won't be able to uh, yani grow and develop. Then we got a ruh inside of us. Mm-hmm. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي Allah Azza wa Jal, he said about Adam, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي The idea is that Allah Azza wa Jal talks about a ruh that is inside of us, that came exclusive from him. No one owns it, no one can play around with it, no one can change it, no one can change its state besides its owner, Allah Azza wa Jal, it's inside of us. That ruh also has needs. It has to feed on something, otherwise it'll die, it'll become black, and it'll lose its purpose in life and since it came from Allah it can only feed from that which Allah Azza wa Jal sends down as well and that is the Quran so the food of the soul is from where the soul came from 
and that is from Allah Azza wa Jal. We find that Allah Azza wa Jal describes the Quran as a ruh. Mm. He said, يُنَزِّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ بِالْرُوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ Allah sends down the angels with a ruh, with revelation. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا We revealed a ruh from our command, Al-Quran. Mm. So that's the soul inside of us is called the ruh. Well, Quran is called the ruh. Mm. So that becomes ruh, a ruh. And that's the idea. That's, that's what heals a person. That's what gives the person patience and resilience in the face of any adversity or calamity he suffers and he faces. And that's what I believe happened to our dear brother there. Mm-hmm. He was inspired by the Quran. His words were Alhamdulillah. Where does Alhamdulillah come from? That's the first ayah in the Quran. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is something we're saying 17 times a day. The tongue is so used to it. But in his case, he's reflecting. He's reflecting. This is a relationship I have with the Quran for this time. Mm-hmm. What's the purpose mm-hmm. of building a relationship with the Quran and reading its ayat and its stories and the sufferings of prophets and what they went through and how they were resilient and patient and grew stronger and stronger only then to forget all that in a time of calamity. There's no point. There's mm-hmm. no success. You achieve nothing mm-hmm. with the Quran. So the real achievement is to take those lessons and to apply them in these moments of calamity, which everyone is going to go through. Everyone will suffer some sort of loss. Mm. But the champion, the one who is successful, is the one who can take those lessons and apply them in their life. life. And that's the secret, Wallahu Alam, for his patience and resilience. Mm. And he becomes an inspiration for people. So what I wanted to do in that khutbah is to draw the attention that, all right, he's just a story of many stories of loss. Mm. The real thing he don't attach yourself to him and his story to the Quran mm. that was his source of strength mm. and that is my source of strength your source of strength Allah. the sustenance Subhanallah. the sustenance of the soul the Quran Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. That's Ruh, it Ruh. It's, it's a beautiful way to describe it Sheikh obviously we've seen you know incredible stories of resilience and incredible stories of, of strength you know but at the same time we cannot ignore the immense amount of pain and suffering. And this Ramadan, unfortunately, is plagued with a lot of suffering, a lot of trauma. Muslims around the world, they're suffering from vicarious trauma because they're being exposed to so much pain and suffering that they are internalizing this trauma and they are also suffering. And while we can be inspired by stories of resilience, many of us are also hurting on the inside. Perhaps in the first weeks, we would make dua, Ya Allah, help us. Ya Allah, aid us. Second week, third week, third month, fourth month, fourth month, we begin to become despondent in our dua. We begin to lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while there are stories of resilience, there are also stories of people losing hope. What is the remedy for this issue? Allahu Akbar. Where are we going to derive inspiration other than the Quran? Where? Yani everything you spoke about, of course, it is a problem that faces the youth, young and old. Um, we need to know that we're human beings. We break, mm-hmm. right? We break uh, financially, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. And when a machine or a device breaks down, we always have to go back to the troubleshooting manual. Mm. Right? That's logically in life, in anything you purchase. You purchase a fridge, if it breaks down, You go to the troubleshooting manual, you read through it, and then that's going to solve that problem. Us too, we have a troubleshooting manual. That is the Quran. Mm. When you're broken, nothing is going to heal you and repair you other than the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. So you're talking about people despairing from the mercy of Allah, losing that hope, right? They lose it. As you explained well, a month, two, three, four go by. Not only that in global events, but also in the lives of people. They suffer relationship losses, a loss of a loved one, whatever it is. And shaitan takes advantage of that moment to keep you away from Allah Azza wa Jal, to keep you distracted from your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. Look at an inspiring story in the Quran. Ya'qub alayhi salam himself. Mm-hmm. Ya'qub suffered, suffered a huge loss and a huge calamity. That is two of his sons going missing. Oh, brother Kamal and, and the dear viewers, if your child dies, it's a lot easier than a child being lost. A dead child, 
There's closure to the matter. Alhamdulillah, we grieve, we are sad, but we know we've buried him and we make dua for him, alhamdulillah. A missing child, a kidnapped child, goes missing, parents don't know where he is. Every single day you wake up to a new worry. What did he eat? What did he drink? Is he in torture? Where is he? Where is he? What is he doing? Does he miss me? Is he crying every day? Has he experienced separation, anxiety? Your mind will be going left and right to the point where Ya'qub alayhi salam, Allah would say about him, وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ His eye became white from sadness. And you know the blackness in the mm-hmm. eye? That became white. He couldn't see. This is the worst type of blindness. A blindness of no return. Mm-hmm. Not only that, فَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ he has become sad, all of him. Mm. He's in a, a huge state of sadness. Take it, watch this. Al Hassan Rahimahullah, he says, This was the situation for 80 years. And he also says, And there was no one on earth more beloved to Allah than Yaqub. Look at this now. He gathers all his children. He is experiencing the most difficult loss a person could go through. Father losing his children and a loved one to him as well. He says to them, Ya Bani Yathabu, Fatahassasu mi Yusuf. Still got hope for him. Mm. He says, My kids go and look for him. Wala tayasu mi rohillah. He says to them, Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. In nahu la yayasu mi rohillahi illa al qomul kafirun. No one despairs from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal except the disbelieving nation. Allahu Akbar. Yahi mm. Kamal, reflect over the fact that he did not say to them, don't lose hope in Allah's mercy when he was comfortable and relaxed and everything's going good in his life. He said this in the most difficult time of his life, when he had lost two children. And his eyes, he cannot, he's blind, and he's mm. full of sadness. Mm. From that moment in life, to say to others, don't lose hope in Allah's mercy. That's an achievement. It's very easy for me and you when things are going good to say Allah Azza wa Jalla is the all merciful. But say it in a situation like that. That's an achievement. And that's why I often reflect on the story. Yes, it has a good ending. He reunites with his children. But wallahi, wallahi for me, the success is not that he reunited with his kids. Allah could have done that for him a week after he lost them. What's going to happen in the paradise? He'll reunite with the and you'll see them and he'll spend yani, forever and ever with them. The success was to remain hopeful in the midst of your calamity. That's the success. That's what Allah wants to see. That's what Allah counts for you. Mm. That's how you increase that relationship with Allah. That's how you actually heal. That's how you repay yourself. That's the guidance of the Quran mm. when it comes to this matter. Do like Yaqub. Hmm. His Surah Yusuf was revealed to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Mecca and he had lost two of his most beloved as well, mm-hmm. Khadija and Abu Talib. And if this story was enough to repair and heal the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and getting mo- get him moving in his mission of spreading and teaching Islam and dealing with that suffering and that calamity, then it's, it is enough for all of us. Allah, Allah. Take, Allah Akbar. take from the story of Ya'qub take from the story of Ya'qub, I guess one of the most profound lessons, you know, I've learned from the story of Ya'qub is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledging the fact that someone can feel pain, someone can feel suffering. It's okay to feel sadness and grief to the point that your your feelings affect your physical health, like you, you lose your eyesight. It's just an incredible realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, captures in the Quran for us. And on that point, Shaykh, um, we've spoken about healing. And obviously in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that within the Quran is healing. There is a healing in the Quran. If you can describe for us what this healing is and how can one truly remedy himself with this healing? How no. can one take full advantage of this healing? No. So one thing you find that's incredible here is the word that Allah chooses. Shifa. يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور. Here more specifically, he says it's a healing for what's in the chest. So there is a general mention that the Quran is shifa, secure, mm. 
But then there is a more specific mention that it is a cure for what's in the chest. That's the heart. Mm-hmm. This is where all troubles are, right? This is where this is where all the bad emotions yeah, that's are. That's where you feel heavy on, on a bad day. <laughs> yeah. This is where it is, you know? This is where doubts are. Mm. This is where jealousy is, where hypocrisy is. This is where depression, anxiety, all of it resides here. Well, Quran is going to heal what's in that. طيب الله عز وجل said shifa. He did not say dawa. What's the difference? Dawa is medicine. Mm-hmm. Shifa is cure. The difference is that at dawa, at times it works, at times it doesn't work. You know, you go to the uh, pharmacy, you purchase dawa, you purchase mm-hmm. medicine. He tells you take it in this manner. It could work. Side effects. But yeah. it might not do anything, right? And then you might got to upgrade to a new dosage or something. Like in the shifa, it's called a cure. It's not. It's not medicine. It is a cure. Yeah. It is a cure. But, but, yeah, this is the word of Allah being poured onto a heart that Allah created. Mm. That's it. That's that's the secret. That's the recipe. Expose this heart that Allah created to the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. Instantly, it heals. How? I don't know. <laughs> Allahu alam. There, there's something in here that cannot be explained and cannot be described. It is not like medicine, it's shifa. You know, mm. medicine, the doctors can tell us, you took a dose, yeah, it enters the body, it spreads in here, it goes to these, the bullet cells carry something of this type of chemical and this is what mm. gets rid of the pain. That can be explained. But how do you explain shifa? Mm-hmm. Medicine can be explained. Shifa cannot be explained. Mm. And so anyone who has taken this on board and has a habit with reading the Quran in times of uh, calamity, when he's broken, when he's sick, let's say, when he's sick, when he's suffering, and seeing the effect of the Quran, he knows what I'm talking about. Allah. Those that haven't tried, that's because they haven't, they haven't tried. They won't, they won't feel it. You know, mm. the youth today, one of the biggest problems of the youth today, they are away from the Quran. They're distant, mm. and that's because they haven't approached the Quran. They haven't approached. They haven't read. They haven't seen what effects it does in life. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions about Surah Al-Fatiha as being shifa, a shifa, Surah Al-Fatiha, from physical illnesses. You know the story of the famous companion. Ayuwa. He came and he read on a person that was stung by a scorpion. That's physical pain. Mm. He read Surah Al-Fatiha on him while blowing onto the wound. The person gets up. He gets up. No pain, no injury, no sickness, no hurt. Mm. He was just about to die. He had venom in his body. Mm -hmm. He got up as though nothing happened. In approval, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to the companion that did that, he approved him. How do you know that this surah is is, is a treatment, is a cure? You might say, oh, but this is a companion's time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're better than us. No, no, no. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. He's not a prophet or anything. And he says, I went to Mecca and I was sick and I didn't find any doctor, nor did I find any medicine. So I began to read Surah Al-Fatiha and I found an incredible healing. And anyone who complained, I also prescribed Surah Al-Fatiha for them. Mm. Oh, Brother Kamal, and I, I have a lecture I did recently. I titled it Healing Through Surah Al-Fatiha. We went ayah by ayah to explain how does Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen heal you from your depression, anxiety, and distress. Mm. And at the end of the surah, I said to them, if we're going to speak about the sickness of jealousy, we're going to have to now do another repeat of the surah, speak about Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, how does that cure, cure jealousy? jealousy? I'm like that. Subhan. Shifa, shifa. Sheikh, you, you've touched on something powerful. You said one of the biggest problems we're experiencing today is that a lot of the youth, a lot of the youth are far from the Qur'an. But we're also witnessing another epidemic, which is a mental health epidemic. A lot of people are feeling despondent, sad, depressed, they have anxiety. And of course, we can speak about, you know, clinical depression and everything. We can put that aside for now. But just the, the constant feeling of sadness and misery most people are feeling around the world. A lack of contentment, a lack of peace, uh, a lack of uh, being one with one with oneself. This is an epidemic we're experiencing right now. But we also know that the Qur'an along with being a healing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says yahdi bihi man ittaba'a ridwanahu subul as-salam that Allah will guide people through this Quran to the ways of peace and you know the search for peace 
is something which is which is high on the agenda of so many people how does one attain this feeling of peace no how does one attain it through the quran this feeling of peace describe for us this feeling of peace no sure uh, peace is a relationship that you develop with allah azawajal peace comes as a result of a relationship you develop with allah azawajal mm. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, when he spoke about the state of the human being, he said, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا mm. The default nature of the human being is that he has been created halu'a. Halu'an meaning he's impatient, he's anxious, he's worried, he's terrified, he's scared, he's always concerned. Mm. That's what halu'a means. He's never at ease. He's never at ease. That's default, default. That's the default position of a human being. طيب. Then Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا Now Allah explaining further the word halu' He says إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ If evil afflicts him Sickness, a loss of health, wealth He lost his job Anything of sharr that happens to him He becomes jazu' Impatient, frustrated Why did this happen to me? He begins to question He doubts, he argues He can't stand that he went through some sort of loss or some sort of calamity. طيب. And on the other hand, وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا mm. If he was given good, he withholds. He becomes stingy, miserly, he holds it back. He doesn't give from it. That's a problem. Allah Azza wa Jal, he made an exception. He said, إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ Except those who are committed to their salat. They will not have this fee of matters that they lose. Why? Because the Musallin are people who know inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. They know we belong to Allah. And everything belongs to Allah and it's ultimately going to return to Him. Can you imagine the state of Umm Sulaim? Umm Sulaim and her husband, <laughs> she, uh, yani, she has a sick child. And her husband always comes late from work and he asks her, how's my son? How is my son? He was very sick until one day he died. And he was in the corner of their room and he was covered with blankets. So her husband said to her that night, how's my son? She said, oh, he hasn't been better. Today he's been still. She didn't tell him he died, but she's saying to him, he's all right, he's good. Okay, so they slept that night and they did what the husband and wife do. Then afterwards, she said to him, I need to tell you something. What is it? He said to her, Imagine our neighbors took something from us. They took something. Then we went and requested it back. Do they have any right to be upset? He says, no. It's our, it's our, it's our product. Why are they going to be upset for? She goes, then Allah Azza wa Jal has taken back what belongs to him. Your son has died. You know, he was a little bit upset. He went to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the idea is, look at this woman. Look how she took care of this situation. What we're seeing is the human being is anxious, he's worried, he's terrified. But when he knows the realities of the Quran, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, that's how he achieves peace in life. Mafi peace without the Quran. There is no peace without allowing your heart to absorb the words Allah Azza wa Jal has given us in the Quran. Someone that knows inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un in a moment of calamity may have peace and tranquility. He's sad. Mm. Calamity is still there. It's going nowhere. But he knows how to deal with it. Compare him to someone who doesn't know inna lillahi wa inna ilahi mm. He doesn't know these words. Well, how, how am I going to expect from him and how is he going to expect from himself to have peace in his life and situation? Where is he going to get it from? From friends. Friends are going to be with you in a moment of calamity for how many days? Mm. One day, two days, one week and then? Everyone's gone back to his work. Everyone mm -hmm. goes back to life. Mm -hmm. Who? Who's going to be with you? Who? Who? Mm -hmm. No one. No one. At the end, you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. If there is no relationship with the word of Allah, with the message of Allah in the Quran, with reflecting over stories of the prophets that share with your pain so that you know you're not unique in this, mm -hmm. where are you going to get the peace from? Mm -hmm. Even that's the, that's the path of peace. Mm -hmm. Illa al Those who are consistent to their salat. And what's the greatest thing we do in Salat? Quran. Mm. The greatest thing we do in Salat is reading Quran. We read Quran. 
as we stand. That's the best position to read Quran in the entire day and night. Because your body is praising Allah while you stand. And your tongue is reading the word of Allah. So is it a special effect like no other. When the peace comes from within, it's far more powerful. And Allah. the world we live in today, they're constantly fixated on trying to achieve peace from without, from the outside. You know, take this, take that, do this, do that. But yeah. we're saying, hey, we have a formula for peace that comes from within. Allah. And subhanAllah, Sheikh, I'd like to share with you that one woman in Germany, she actually conducted a study to see who are the people, the demographic of people that experience the highest level of happiness. She's from the University of Mainham. And she done a study on a sample size, I believe over 50,000 people. This wasn't something small by any mm -hmm. means. It was a very large sample size, over 50,000 people. And she concluded that the people who experienced the highest rate of contentment were the Muslims. Allahu Akbar. And the people that experienced the lowest rate of contentment were people who were atheists, who didn't believe in anything. And subhanAllah, if anything proves everything you've just mentioned, it's this study. You have an empirical study that's been delivered showing that the Muslims experience the highest late rate of contentment. Subhanallah. You know, there's an ayah in the Quran for this. Mm. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Alladheena amanu wa lam yalbisu imanahum bi dhulm ulaika lahumul amnu wa hum muhtadun. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, those who commit to faith, mm. amanu, they believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, in his existence, his names, his attributes, his lordship, and they worship him. وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بظلم. They do not tarnish their iman with oppression. Oppression here is shirk. Mm. And if they don't associate partners with Allah, they don't worship other than Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah said, for such people, لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ They will have security. Mm. They will have safety. They will not fear anything mm. because if Allah Azzawajal is the Lord of the world and he's the strongest and the almighty, what are they going to fear? Mm. If you're on his side, what are you going to fear? وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ And such people are guided. And so, مفهوم المخالفة يعني the contrary understanding of this ayah would mean that those who do not believe in Allah mm. and the worst of them, the atheist rejects the complete idea of Allah mm. Azzawajal لَهُمُ الْخَوْفِ mm. For them is fee and pain and anxiety. Why? And to think of it, you're on this earth, you don't believe in Allah, yani, yani you're terrified. What mm. happens? What is happening? Who controls all this? Mm. When I die, where am I going? Where, yani, and to, you're, you're, you're traveling on earth, you don't, you don't have any hope in anything, mm. in anyone. This is out of human nature. Allah mm. did not create us mm. to just be walking around having nothing and no source to, to turn back to. And, you know, and even in times of calamity, you'll find that even those who disbelieve in Allah somehow will utter the word Allah yeah. mm. in the most intense calamity of theirs. Yeah. There are no atheists on a sinking ship, they say. Absolutely yeah. nothing. You know, and subhanAllah on this, I remember I was in Ireland mm. a few months ago. And there was an atheist there. We had a very heavy debate. But one thing I remember saying to him, and it touched him. He's saying he doesn't worship. I go, and I mentioned his name. I said to him, in times of calamity when you're sick, uh, who, who, do you, who do you turn to? Yeah, like, what can the doctors mm. do? What do your friends come out? What do, you, what do you do? Isn't there something inside screaming to turn to someone? Why are you resisting that? Why are you fighting it? Why don't you just accept it? Go with the flow. That's Allah. We call that Allah. Why mm -hmm. don't you answer? Why don't you call? And that's the same thing Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi did with Imran ibn Hussain. You know, Imran, he used to worship seven lords on earth. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi he said to him, how many idols do you worship? He goes, I got seven on earth, one in the heavens. Mm -hmm. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said to him, in times of difficulty, who do you call on to? He said, I call on to the one in the heavens. <laughs> so Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, he gave him logic. He goes to him, if the one in the heaven can sort out your problems in the most difficult times, can't he do everything else in the most easy of times? Mm, mm, mm. He thought of it and he accepted Islam and he threw out all his idols. Mm. What for? Why Subhan waste your time with the seven idols on Allah earth Allah. when you have the Rabb? Allah 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 Allah. Allah. For such people, it's security and peace. Now, mm. So that's, that explains that research Allah of that Allah. woman. Allah. It's a beautiful way to explain Allah. it, subhanAllah. Sheikh, obviously in the month of Ramadan, we have one of the most famous narrations that goes around every single Ramadan. 
من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. He who fasts the month of Ramadan with faith and conviction will have his previous sins forgiven. The most famous hadith we hear this time and time again. Now we all know what it means to to fast with faith, you know, to believe in Allah. But to have this conviction is something which many people struggle with. Many people feel like, you know, is Allah pleased with me? Is Allah going to reward me? Maybe Allah doesn't like me. Is Allah displeased with me? And we struggle with this sense of conviction, trying to have this optimism in Allah. At what point does this become very unhealthy to our iman? And again, how would we remedy this? No. There is no doubt that the highest level of iman is al yaqinu billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Iman is levels. Mm-hmm. The highest of them is to be certain in your faith about Allah Azza wa Jal. That's the highest level. Well, Yaqeen is the greatest blessing given to a person. Mm-hmm. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned this in a hadith that the greatest blessing a person could be given is Al Yaqeen. Mm-hmm. And the second greatest blessing is Al Afiyah, well being. Well, Yaqeen is something that we work on every single day. It's the worships that you conduct. It's your taqwa. It's the, the, the commandments of Allah that establish in your life and you keep away from the prohibition that increases and strengthens your yaqeen. Mm. And they're all tied. It's all tied with each mm. other. It's not a matter of sitting down and let me research this yaqeen and see how can it develop. Mm. It's your worship that increases the yaqeen. That's how it is. Right? So now, every time a person prays, his yaqeen increases. Because who did you pray for? You prayed mm-hmm. for Allah. That means Allah Azza wa mm-hmm. exists. You're worshipping Him. Mm-hmm. Like you read Quran, you're reading this Quran, you're reading the word of Allah, you're absorbing these realities of life, you're reading things of the future, things that no historian has ever seen and documented. Allah knows it, mm-hmm. it increases my yaqeen. Mm-hmm. That truly Allah knows this and He's telling us as it is. That's how you develop that yaqeen, right? You reflect over the afterlife. How can al ulama? One of the ways in where they would increase their yaqeen, he would see him, he would say to him, Ya assalamu alaikum. He'd come out of a, it's like he was he was dozed out. Mm-hmm. He said, where are you? He goes, I just reached as sirat mm-hmm. He was thinking, he, he, he was sitting. He thought, okay, now I died. I am my grave. I came out. I'm standing in the hisab. And then this guy just disturbed me now. I, I was at the Sirat now. Mm. This is one of the ways to strengthen that Yaqeen, to always mm. focus on the afterlife, where we're going, how it's going to unfold, prepare for those days. Hadal Yaqeen, it develops with actions that you do. Mm-hmm. It's not a matter of just sitting down. So, Man Salam Ramadan, Iman, and Hakil Iman, you're going to fast mm. Ramadan, and you know. Allah Azza wa Jal sees this from you. He hears it from you. You know, you, you mentioned the thing is that people are making dua, whatever they call, is Allah hearing me? Is he responding? Well, you know, Salat the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us mm. when the servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah responds and he says, Hamidani Abdi. My slave has been grateful to me. Hey, there you go. Allah heard you. Mm-hmm. That confusion, mm-hmm. that doubt you had, is Allah hearing us? No, Allah mm. heard you and he responded mm. to you as well. Alhamdulillah. 17 times a day. Mm. So that worry and that doubt should be eliminated. Eliminated. You know, when you make dua, who do you make dua to? Mm-hmm. That's why when a person is far away from a dua, yes, of course, that affects his relationship mm. with Allah. And we say, the stronger your dua, the more dua, the stronger your relationship with Allah. The less dua in your life, your relationship with Allah is weak. Why? Because you chose not to talk to him. The one who turns away from dua is like saying, Allah, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. The one who makes dua, he's saying, Allah, I enjoy talking to you. And the best type of dua that instills that yaqeen is the silent dua. Not the dua you say aloud. You might ask what's better to say, Allahumma ghfirli, you know, and keep just mm-hmm. my tongue, and I can't even hear myself, or to say, Allahumma ghfirli, and raise my voice a little so I can hear myself. You know which one's better? It's to remain silent, even if you are in private alone by yourself. Why? Because the one who makes dua absolute silence, 
he has more certainty that even though he couldn't hear himself, Allah is here. Mm-hmm. So he strengthens strengthens that yaqeen and that was what Allah praised from Zakaria Allah. He praised him. It wasn't Allah Sawajal in that ayah wasn't telling us about his situation, how he made his dua. He was actually praising him for that khafiyan silent. No one heard him. No one documented it. Allah saw it. He heard it. And he told us in the Quran, which now strengthens our belief that even if we couldn't hear ourselves, Allah heard us, just like he heard Zakari. Sheikh, and ihtisab, and I think I translated it wrong before. I think I said conviction. But I think I was meant to say like anticipating a reward no, from no. Allah. Seeking reward. Yeah. Seeking reward. No, no, we fast with these two things. Out of faith, mm-hmm. we know that Ramadan is obligatory. Mm-hmm. We know we're fasting it for Allah and no one else. Mm-hmm. And ihtisaban as well. We're human beings. Mm-hmm. And the human being loves to get reward for what he does. Allah Azza wa is the most generous. We fast, we fast for ourselves. It purifies us, it cleans us, it prepares us. But from the generosity of Allah is that he says, I'm going to reward you for the good you did for yourself. Ihtisaban, mm-hmm. ihtisaban, seeking Allah's reward. We don't want any worldly appreciation. Mm. We don't want people to think of us righteous and mashallah, fast the Ramadan. We don't want that. We want appreciation and thanks and reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. Then you see, what is the end result? Ghufira lahu ma taqadda min Ghufir. His previous sins have been forgiven. forgiven. See the language? Mm-hmm. He didn't say, Sa'aghfiru lahu ma taqadda min I'll forgive his previous sins. He said his sins have already been forgiven. Done and dusted. Well, and in this type of language, when Allah speaks in the past, it implies certainty. Absolutely, it's happening. All mm-hmm. sins will be erased and removed. So optimism in Allah. Yeah. To have this optimism oh, in Allah. 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 Seeking, yani, yani having our sins forgiven is the greatest goal we have on earth. Because if that happens, everything else follows. The pleasure of Allah, the paradise, seeing Allah, all of that will be guaranteed. Mm-hmm. That's why Allah would say, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ بَعْدَانْ وَجَنَّةٍ mm-hmm. Rush to the forgiveness. First. Then to the uh, paradise of, of, of Allah. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about the paradise. That will come. And to worry about your sins and being forgiven. If that's removed and you die with no sins, this, this is the biggest success. Allahu mm-hmm. Akbar. Sheikh, some practical advice before we conclude the podcast. We have... For example, a young man went into the corporate world, working nine to five, comes home exhausted. He can't get time off of work in Ramadan, struggles to make the most out of Ramadan. I guess he feels very sad with himself, unhappy with himself. What advice would you give to a person in this situation, either in the corporate world, at university, the circumstances have gotten to him in the best time of the year? Okay, so so people like that need to be realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, that his work is important. That's mm-hmm. his livelihood. That's his income. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded us aslan in the Quran. Um, Allah Azza wa Jal wants us that we work and we earn our own income and livelihood and so on. Okay. So number one, don't detach your work from worship. If you leave your house, with the intention that Allah wants me to make effort for my own rizq, then congratulations, alhamdulillah, mm. that's something Allah is pleased mm. with, Allah is happy with this. Don't think of yourself as, you know, Ana, Ana, I'm, I'm, I'm far away, I, you know, I can't even get my worships right. Oh, this is a worship. Mm. Leave if the intention. The intention fixes everything up. On the day of judgment, we're going to realize and be shocked that we were rewarded a lot more for our intention than our actions. Mm. Put the intention right. You're leaving, you're working because Allah said, وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ That's what Allah said. That's what Allah wants us to do. Now the other thing is when it comes to worships, practical worships, as-salat, wal-Qur'an, wal-tasbih and that, I find one very powerful uh, advice and this is yani inspired by the words of Imam Ahmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rule is this. Uh, Very practical. 
For every worship, make a standard for yourself. Be realistic, make a proper realistic standard. So let's say it's the Quran. Okay. My standard is every day I'm going to read one page. Not just reading, but read. I want to understand its explanation through tafsir al-Sa'di or any tafsir that is available. And I'm going to read that page and make that the center of my day, that page. Or reflect over its meanings and try to implement what I can. But that's it. That's my standard mm-hmm. for life. On days in where I have energy, and that comes to us. Mm-hmm. Maybe a Saturday, Sunday, you have nothing, no work for this person that works in that corporate life. On days there is energy, there is ability. Do a lot more. Read more than a page. Take advantage because that energy doesn't last. It Mm -hmm. goes away. Mm -hmm. And on days where you don't have energy at all, don't drop under your standard. Keep that standard. That's it. That's Mm -hmm. a beautiful relationship. And do it with all worships. Fasting. Let's say, inshallah, after Ramadan, you're going to fast every Monday. Because between Monday and Thursday, Monday would be the better day. Mm -hmm. So choose Monday. That's your standard. If on certain weeks you feel stronger, do Monday, Thursday, do some more. Mm -hmm. If on days you just, I can't do anything, at least you don't drop from the Mm -hmm. Monday. And with your night prayers like that, two rakat, mas al-witr. That's your standard. You find energy, do more. Mm -hmm. You don't find the energy, don't go under your standard. If you implement this in your life, wallahi, wallahi, you will realize and you'll appreciate hadith in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ahabbu al-a'mali ila Allah adwamuha wa in qallat. That the most beloved, akhi kamal, we're speaking about what Allah loves, the small deeds you do, but be consistent in them. Doesn't matter how small it is, it's the consistency that counts. Allah loves it. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal that this advice could be of benefit for us and that we implement it. And a one minute advice for a new mother. For a new mother in She's Ramadan. coming into Ramadan, she's got this child, a baby's come into her life. She doesn't know what to do. She's stressing out. By the time she gets free time, she's super exhausted, doesn't know what to do. What advice would you give her? Allah, yani, if we wanted to open this door, it can lead us to another whole podcast mm-hmm. altogether. But I find today's day and age um, one of the greatest greatest let's say job titles a woman has is motherhood and this is a deed it's a worship motherhood is a worship and it is the most obligatory thing especially in this day and age that parents must be fulfilling motherhood Heather we need to revive the spirit of motherhood looking after your child feeding him, nurturing him, let it take the whole day. Mm-hmm. All of this is rewarded by Allah Azza You're looking after a child. Put the intention and say, by, by, uh, say, say, Ya Allah, my project in life, my sacrifice in life is going to be this child. I want to nurture him and raise him to be a good, righteous, upright, pious Muslim that knows you and worships you. Allahu Akbar, this will make it all worth it. Every time you breastfeed him, there is immense reward. Any care that you give for him, there is immense reward. Only Allah Azawajal could reward you for. Right? So don't, don't detach motherhood and don't detach the type of dealing you have with your child and looking after him. Don't detach it from worship. This is worship. That's the most obligatory worship in life now. This is the most obligatory thing you're supposed to be doing because it's, 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 Allah gave you responsibility for it. You'll be questioned about him on the day of judgment. Mm. So relax, relax, look after this child. And in the time that Allah Azza wa gives you, that you're able to do some form of worship, do to the best of your ability. Alhamdulillah, mm. we didn't have to feel mm. bad about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Feel good. Appreciate the blessings Allah have given, has given you. Appreciate the time you get. Use it in the worship of Allah wherever you can. As long as the obligations, of course, are done, Allah. a person will be in, in good khair. shape. I'm sure that would uplift a lot of people that were to hear those words. Jazakallah khair, Allah. Sheikh. Sheikh, you've obviously, obviously spent many years in a da'wah and you've made a lot of statements in the past. There's one statement you made, like I think a year ago or two years ago. It has still stuck with me to this day about the month of Ramadan. You said, 
if anything was to demonstrate the impact of the sunnah, it was in the tumblr. Allah in the Allah date, Allah, yes. we're talking about mass production, Allah, Allah, Allah. billions of dates produced around the world on every single person's dinner table, whether you're in India, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, wherever you go in the world, every single Muslim, we're talking about 2 billion Muslims, are all breaking their fast on the same piece of food simply because of a practice that was narrated 1400 years ago. SubhanAllah. One hadith narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu, powerful, that just shows you the barakah of the sunnah. Because mm. even if you try to calculate, how many date, how many palm trees do you need to produce this many amount mm. of dates? Mm. Doesn't make sense. Taking mm. barakah and Allah azawajal, when things are covered with barakah, you don't calculate them. That's the rule. Just keep away from care. Don't measure, don't calculate. If something has barakah, it'll give a lot more yeah. than what is expected from it. Lakin, alhamdulillah, ala na'mat al-islam wa sunnat al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We'll end with one last personal question for the Shaykh. You've mentioned about the, I guess, the profound nature of the impact of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you've spent years in the da'wah. Your family has spent years in the da'wah. I'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept to make you guys Ameen. from Ameen. Ahlul Qur'an, Ameen. to make us all from Ahlul Ameen. Qur'an. Ameen. This Ramadan, I ask Allah to accept it for you as well. Ameen. You were to meet the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the day of judgment. No. What would that countenance look like? What would that interaction look like? You got to embrace him. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Wallahi, we're, we're just waiting for that moment. I think I think in a moment like this, Yani, what can a person say? What can he say? Other than just Yani, take that moment seeing in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, listening, listening. He wants to talk to his Ummah. He wants to congratulate them for what they have reached, what they have attained, what they have earned for their sacrifice. So I think I think but I don't know. Wallahi I don't know. I, I get asked this sometimes, I think about it, I even take time to think to say that if I'm questioned about this next time, here's my prepared answer. <laughs> but every time, I get nothing. Hey, how? <laughs> yeah, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what are you say? Even if you ask the question, sometimes the companions themselves wouldn't say anything. Allah wa Rasulullah wa alam. <laughs> they wouldn't dare to talk. Fa, nah, may Allah azza wa jal Unite us with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we can feel that that that, that experience with him. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Abu Bakr Zawad. I believe that this podcast, it really captured the meaning, the, the meaning of healing, the meaning of the remedy of the Qur'an. And inshallah, will give a lot of people going into Ramadan this year with a new sense of peace, with a new sense of security, with a new sense of healing, all derived from the Qur'an. Jazakallah khairan Sheikh Abu Rizal. It's been a pleasure having you, an honor having you. I believe it's been a phenomenal and a beneficial conversation. And I ask Allah to bless you in your work. Jazakallah khair. Allah yahfazna jami'an. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward you, reward our listeners. We wish everyone success in this life and in the afterlife. Barakallah fiqh. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.